All right, we're back. Let these dry overnight. And uh, I think I've got just enough varnish in here to do one more coat. You can see they're not quite as glossy. The bottoms are still a little bit wet, but I think I'm just gonna leave that a single coat and just see if I can hit the tops of these. And I think that'll do it. I might also get the sides while I'm at it. And I'm noticing this varnish, even though I put a bag over it overnight, it's still skinned over and it left little chunks. So I'm gonna be picking those off, I think. And uh, this may end up creating more work than I'd hoped, but let's see if I can get away with it. Yeah, it's not so bad. Worst case scenario, if there are some little bumps or nuggets of, of varnish in there that, that stick up, I can always come back later and hit them with a little sandpaper or something. This is pretty forgiving stuff. Or I can just leave them there and they can be traction strips for people that may want to walk on this. So in my last video, I was reviewing the footage and it looks like the camera was aimed too low. So I apologize for my poor camera skills. Um, I could edit some of that out and then ask for forgiveness. But I noticed as I was doing these boards, it was just above the screen, which I think would be really annoying if I'm trying to see what somebody's doing. Almost like a teaser. Anyway. That was not intentional, and I'll try to get better. Most of the storage in my garage is devoted to many things. So, and that that's not necessarily all train related. It's, I guess the majority of the square foot is footage is cars. And uh, then I've got raw materials and tools spread around. And so, so I have to be super efficient with the, the rail cars that I have on this railroad. And they have to serve at least one purpose. I can't just have decorative rail cars. So flat cars, tank cars, those kinds of things seem to be the most useful. We are really getting down there. I think I might be almost dry brushing the last end of this thing. I'm not careful. Let's see. Oh, there's a little bit in the corner there. With some chunks, of course. Yeah, so any any furniture finishers are probably cringing watching me struggle with this thing. They'd probably just say, go out and buy a new can. But I, I should say you can't make money by wasting it. That's, that's probably the best way. So as you can see, we are pretty much down to nothing there. So I'm just going to clean some of these up, make sure the little chunkies are gone. All right. You know the routine. Bob Ross. All right, we're back. The uh, varnish has dried, and uh, it turned out really nice. Bring that up to the camera so you can see it. It's still got a nice texture from the, the saw marks and everything, so it shouldn't be too slippery when it's wet. So I'm going to test fit these and poke the screws through and see how they fit. I think most of these are pretty clear, but I may have to... There's a couple where there's a little varnish in the hole, but I think it'll still work, so... Let's see if I can figure out my numbering system here. 
There's number one. Oh yeah, this is going to be fine. I'm just going to put the, the screws in without the nuts on them. And well, best laid plans. Apparently my pen is soluble in varnish. So thankfully I kept these all in order. And uh, I think this is the same orientation. So I'm, I'm going to have to remark these, but I'll put these in and make sure they fit. And then I'll renumber them now that the varnish is dried. But I can see these holes are lining up very well. I know you're in there somewhere. There we go. Look at that. That looks pretty good. If I didn't like the shine, if for some reason I wanted to dull this, one thing you can do is take either real fine sandpaper or steel wool. Um, I like to use the quadruple ot because I use that on other projects where I don't want to scratch chrome. The quadruple ot steel wool can be used on, for example, rusty drum hardware or car parts where you want to get rid of the rust, but you don't want to mess with the chrome. And, and so I have that on hand, but I like it. I kind of like the glossy look, and I'm sure it's, it'll dull down over time anyway. But let me grab this tank. We'll do a test fit. Ah, that's heavier than I remember. So the front of the car is facing away from the camera. And, oh, this is going to be nice. Let me grab the regulator. So this regulator needs to be right up on the front end of the car here. And it looks like I'm gonna to need to build a bracket for it. Okay, I figured it out. So I've got my center lines marked and I've got some pilot holes drilled for the T-nuts. I'll grab one for you. There we go. You can see it's got threads in the middle and then these little spiky things. So this is gonna come up through the bottom of the wood and these will anchor into the bottom. Anyway, that's the point of a T-nut. So the other thing I figured out is on this board, because the hole is in the center and the center spine is right under there. So if I put this T-nut under here, it's gonna stick out a little bit. So what I need to do is use a Forzner bit or a large drill bit and just slightly recess that so this T-nut can sit flush with the bottom. That way we don't get rocking action there. So we've got that going on. Um, this side's no problem because it straddles the center spine, so I don't have to worry about countersinking those T-nuts. The other thing I came up with, I have this regulator and I wanted it to mount nicely on the deck so it's not flopping around. So I had a piece of angle steel and I made a little cardboard template and that will fit right here, I think. So I found some of these screws that are longer and I'll just reassemble it with, with these screws here. I think I'm going to mount it this way so it finishes cleaner and then it'll have two T-nuts similar to these recessed right here on the deck. So it looks something like this when it's all done. And that puts the, the fuel line right where it's going to take off for the, the next tender in front of it. Okay. All you carpenters are probably screaming through the internet right now. How about one of these? This will get us a little bit closer. Now we'll pick up our hole centers. I'm going to take a quick measurement and get back to you. Okay, I took some more measurements of the hose length that comes back and so I'm about three, three and a half inches back and four inches up from the center line. And if I measure that out, the arc of that comes out really nicely with this 45 degree angle. So this will be a here, it'll be slightly forward because of the thickness of the heads of these things. So just sit down kind of right in here like this. Okay, so I'm about ready to drill the holes for these T-nuts. 
and I think it's probably sufficient to drill the hole oversized so this barrel can just slip up and then rely on the little spiky things to hold it. But I like to overthink things sometimes and then underthink the real critical stuff. So, so I'm going to take a dial caliper here and I'm getting about 0.293, so 293 thousandths or 0.293 inches. And I've got a drill bit here that's about 0.280 so it's going to be a little snug i may have to step up one size but i also know that sometimes you know when you drill in a hole in wood sometimes the hole's just a little bit bigger than the bit by the time you're done so i'm going to start with this bit and then work up from there and so there's nothing critical under here so i'm going to just do these in place Ooh, yeah that's what i'm talking about here's another one these are my nice sharp wood bits and they, they grab a little bit more than I expected. So the other thing about drilling into wood is, is it can be splintery. So they always say you want to drill so that the splinter goes to the non-finished side, which is the bottom in this case. And yeah, that's not going to work. That's a little too tight. I know what's going to happen. This is a hardwood. And if I just take a hammer and start running that thing in there, it's going to split the wood out and then I got to start all over. So experience tells me I need a bigger drill bit. Okay, so I have an assortment of bits. So let's step up to the next size and see if we have luck with that one. So this is, can you see that? That's a 296. So we're sneaking up on it. That's, that's about the size we need. We'll just go in and do another one. Let's check that now. Yeah, that is going to get it. It's it's snug enough that I can feel it sort of holding the barrel, but we're not going to split all the wood out. So I think that's what we're going to use. So now that we've developed this method on these, we'll do it for these others. But before I do that, I need to think about this hole. If I go and drill that full diameter, and then I want to put a Forstner bit in there, I may not have a means of centering that bit. So I'm going to leave that small hole. Um, I'm going to save that for last. I don't want to mess this up. So let's go over to these other ones first. Hopefully not stab the deck with the spinning drill bit. Okay. We only need to go down just a little bit to uh, to countersink the surface of this. So let's, let's give that a shot. I'm going to do it not over the steel spine because I don't want to dull the tip of this. All right, we're just going to go nice and easy. Just like that. So I haven't drilled the full center hole yet, but let's check fit. Let's go back to that drill bit that we found earlier, which is a 1964th and do the, the rest of the hole. Oh. And before I do that, I want to do it from the top. Yeah, I'm already starting to split stuff out. So let's do it from the top. And yeah, we got a little chippy there, but I think that's going to work. Let's see. I think that's going to lay in there nicely. It'll be just enough so it doesn't stick out proud. So I've got, I've also got this one, but this one doesn't have to be countersunk. So let's take both of these over to the workbench and drive them home. Okay, so I found a little wood rasp, and that's great. I can sort of clean these edges up without splitting out. There's a little bit of a chip there, but I can hit that with a spot of urethane if I'm really concerned. And I'm trying to sort of push in so that I don't cause any more splitting. Yeah, that's going to work fine. And I'll do the same. This one's pretty clean already, but I'll just kind of hit those edges a little bit. And when I'm all done, I'll take a little, little of that varnish and just take a Q-tip or a swab of some kind and put some in. Okay, so we want the bottom of this thing. Here's the shiny top. There's the bottom. Here's where we're headed. So let's see. Are we? Yeah, you can see that. Here we go. 
Look at that. Look at that. Here's a straight edge. It passes right over it. So that's that's going to do the job. So let's do this other one before we forget. Uh, loud noise warning if you're uh, sensitive to that kind of thing. All right, we're back over here. We're, we're going to put on the nuts and fasten these deck boards down. So these are stainless. So, okay. I'm going to give this a healthy bonk. Probably shake everything off of it. There it goes. Look at that. They, they kind of sit down flush. Let's see if we can... There's probably a much simpler way to do this, but... In fact, the, the way to do it would be to set all of these, like I've done on this side, and then flip the whole thing over and get on it with these. In fact, let's just do that. Let's 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 think smart and, uh, and not have to work so hard. So we'll just keep marching down the line here. And we can do the front end. If I remember right, there's an engineering standard for washers, and I'm going to point it out to you. When you get a washer, there's like a like a sharp edge and then kind of a rounded edge. One, you know, one's kind of more finished looking and one's sharp. And if I recall correctly, you face the sharp one away from the thing you're clamping to. So, so in this case, I want the rounded edge to be against the metal or against the wood because it's less likely to dig in and cause a problem. And that's probably way overkill for what this is because we're never going to have that kind of vibration on this equipment. But on, you know, on an aircraft or something, that could be a, a real deal. Fun, useless fact to clutter your brain. You know, you can you can forget your phone number, but now you know about washer orientation. All right, I'm over on the metal lathe. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is a, a means of clamping onto a part and spinning it at a speed. And then we've got tool holders, and then we've also got a drill tool that I could bring in that can hold drill bits or, or dies for cutting threads. There's a lot of things you can do with a metal lathe. So what I'm going to do here, I have, I have this bolt. It's a 3 8 bolt, and I need the length to be somewhere right there. You can see uh, this upper end where my thumb is. That's my minimum length. That's the, the length from the top of the flat car frame to the bottom of the bolster. And I need to be just beyond that maybe a 16th, 32nd, 32nd of an inch, um, and then I'll drill a hole, and uh, and that's where that keeper pin will be. So this will be going down, and there'll be a keeper pin that goes this way. But I want to get rid of these threads. I don't want these to saw against the frame, even though it's really not that critical in this case. It's very difficult to drill a hole through these threads. So um, there's a couple options. If I if I didn't mind the threads being there, I could just take a grinder and grind a smooth spot, use a center punch, and drill my cross hole. But since I have the lathe handy, I'm just going to turn off all of these and make it a nice smooth end. It will taper down, but it's not critical for this flat car because the weight is holding the flat car on the trucks. The only time that the pin is really functioning in tensile strength stress is if I pick the flat car up with the trucks under it, they will stay put. They'll stay attached to the flat car. So let's go over a little bit of safety. So I'm wearing safety glasses. I have a shield behind here. I don't know if you, there you can see that. There's a shield there that keeps the hot chips from flying against the stuff behind. Um, and that's a, it's a heat proof or heat resistant shield. So a hot chip that bounces off isn't gonna burn its way through. Um, 
This is my tool holder, so I can move this back and forth. It also has a lead screw, so if I want it to mechanically move at a, a, a prescribed rate relative to the turning of, of this piece, I can do that. I can engage it. So this is a chuck key. Rule number one is never leave the chuck key in the chuck because if you leave it in here and it's up here and you hit the power switch, this thing's going to take your head off. So so that's, that's the main rule that we want to focus on. We also want to not have loose sleeves or hair because if you get wrapped up in this, it, it's not a huge motor, but it's it's going to do some damage. You don't want to be wrapped up in a, a place like this. So we're going to try to do our best to, to be safe here. And I am not a machinist by trade. I'm just an amateur hobbyist, but I'm trying to do this safely. So let's get started. We'll put a little bit of lubrication on here so you don't chew up our bit. I'm going to engage the lead screw. Now, when I turn it on, flip a lever and it will feed itself. On a bigger machine, you could do this in one pass. In fact, I could probably do what I'm doing here in one pass, but I just want to show you how this works. So I'm kind of keeping an eye on where I want to be. And when I get to the end, I just disengage. I drag it back and then I dial it in a little bit more. I'm going to go 20 more thousandths in and engage it and see where that gets me. And put a little lube on there so it doesn't chew up my hair. That's looking better. There's a little shadow of a thread there, but I'm okay with that. That's going to work fine. So then when I get to the end of where I want to stop cutting, I just disengage right now. And I'm going to freehand this, kind of turn a chamfer there. There we go. Let me point out what I did there. So anytime you have a 90 degree angle where if this went and then had a hard 90 out this way and that way, you get a potential stress riser. And, and for what I'm doing here, it probably makes no difference at all because this isn't a a high stress part. But if you were doing an axle, for example, for a little steam locomotive or something, you would want to eliminate any 90 degree cuts like that. Because if that's a point where the stresses can't travel easily to the next part of the metal, and there's going to be a tendency for it to crack there. So what I did here is I went down and then I sort of pulled out and angled at the same time. So it makes a smoother transition. And now, because this is only mild steel. It doesn't turn super smoothly. I'm going to go in and, and file that down. Okay, this is called the parting off tool. It's just a, a tool designed to run into the work this direction to cut it to length. Now there's, there's a lot of different ways we can cut to length. We can use a band saw, we can use a parting off tool. People have even had hack saws where you can just hold it and the work turns against the hacksaw. But to me, this is a little safer. So I'm gonna bring this up and sort of square it up with the jaws. There, sneak up on it. There we go. So I wanna leave a little extra material beyond, but what I'll do, we'll go one tool length away. So there's one, I've got my mark with my eye, There, there's two. Put a little lubrication on there. Okay, we've got room to spin everything. There we go. And we're gonna just continually dab lubrication into that opening. It's a lot of tool pressure with a tool this wide, so I'm just feeding it nice and slow, keeping it lubricated. Then when it gets to the end, this little bad boy is gonna go flying. There it went. We'll clean up the edge like that get this out of our way and throw the file on it really quick. Now we want to put that chamfer back on it. Okay, I've got this loosely placed in the vise here. You can see I've got my little jaw protectors. These are just pieces of aluminum that I bent because these jaws otherwise will mark up the things you're working on. So they, they call them soft jaws sometimes. I'm going to make a flat spot with this file. 
I'm going to make this look easy with the power of video editing. So we got that. I'm going to step it over. There we go. Right there. That looks good to me. And it just left a little dimple. It's hard to see that, but it's enough that the drill bit will pick that up. You know, ideally you want this to go straight through and come out on the center of the bottom. But if, if you're angled even slightly up here, it's going to dive one way or the other. And again, for this part, it's not critical. But if, if you really needed to get that precise, there are ways that you can take like a piece of metal and balance it on that flat spot and look at the ends. And, you know, if one side's high, you can keep adjusting this until you get it perfectly square. And then you, you could also do something like put it on a milling machine with one of those big fat, you know, center bits and start a centering hole and then let the drill, then put a drill bit in and follow that down. There, you can kind of tell right when it touches that hole. Let me get my hand out of your way here. I'm not putting an excessive amount of pressure because I don't want that drill bit to wander too far off of the center line. If you push real hard on a drill bit, sometimes it can steer itself in weird ways as it works through the material. Clear those chips. There we go, we're through. When you really get deep into the, the hole that you're drilling, sometimes you'll hear those little clicks and pops, and if you allow that to happen too much, What's happening is that the chips aren't necessarily clearing out of here and you can help, you can lubricate that. That helps. And you can also do what they call peck drilling where you go in, it makes some chips pull out and then wipe the chips and go back in, especially for soft metals that can be handy. So again, we, we did pretty well on that. It's a nice centered hole. Um, you can see that burr, that's gonna rip my hand up. So we're gonna go over here and uh, Hit that with a file. And hit the other side. And then another trick I'm going to do, this may be over engineering again, but I'm going to take a slightly larger drill bit and I'm going to chamfer the opening so we don't have that sharp edge. They make chamfering tools, but I don't have one. So you just do light pressure just like that and what that'll do is when this pin is in here it's not going to work against a hard edge it also helps you guide that pin in when it's time to install it because remember this is going to be underneath that flat cuff and it's not going to be super easy to reach and you're going to be a big old hurry to run your trains because you'll be so excited to run trains so you know try to to make it easy on ourselves there we go so here's how that works we just put a pin in there well there it is i've done up all the gas connections checked everything for tightness and mounted the tank on to show you what it looks like. There's the truck assembly under there. We've got our couplers mounted. Regulator with a little extra length of hose. And then some nice storage back here. I can use these points here to mount bungees or netting, throw a backpack on there, or maybe a little toolbox. Well, that's about it for this project. If you like what you're seeing and you want to see more projects on cars or trains or anything in between, hit like and subscribe and uh, leave some comments below. I'll, I'll take a look at them if you have anything specific in mind. I do have some floor welding to do on this. There's little patches, but 
but not too bad of rust and a few other things. So we can talk about that or we can do a little machining. Anyway, thanks again. Uh, thanks for watching.